This is a short video about Conway's calculus proof of the irrationality of square root of 2, but we also get a lot more along the way. I learned this proof from John H. Conway quite a few years back. I think this is due to him, although it's possible he credited it to someone else. What's cool about it is that it's a proof of a number theoretic result, namely that the square root of 2 can't be written as the quotient of two whole numbers, that uses no number theory whatsoever. In particular, we won't ever mention prime numbers, factorizations, or even care whether fractions are in lowest terms. All that we need is some basic algebra and just a touch of calculus, so little that the calculus part can even be avoided. Let's get started by taking the nearest integer, that is, nearest whole number, to square root of 2. This would be 1, though the exact value isn't important. All that matters is that it's close to square root of 2. Subtracting this from root 2 gives the number root 2 minus 1. Let's make a couple of observations about the powers of this number. First, second, third, fourth, etc. First, our base is strictly less than 1 in absolute value, so the limit of these powers is 0. Recall that the correct way to think about this is to consider the set of all of these numbers, then see what happens to that set as we remove more and more terms from the start of the sequence. The limit being 0 means that these sets of numbers squeeze closer and closer to 0, but note that none of them need to equal 0. This equal sign with limits can be a bit misleading. They only need to squeeze closer and closer to zero. For our purposes, all that matters is that at some point these powers will squeeze as close to zero as we like. Let's call this fact number one. Note that we could avoid all mention of limits if we do a little bit of algebra with logarithms, but limits are a convenient way of expressing what we need. Second is an observation about the form that these powers take. The first power, of course, is just root 2 minus 1. We can obtain each subsequent power by multiplying the previous power by root 2 minus 1. The second power is root 2 minus 1 times root 2 minus 1. And following this out, we get 2 minus 2 root 2 plus 1, which simplifies to negative 2 root 2 plus 3. The third power is this times root 2 minus 1. Foiling out again, negative 2 root 2 plus 3 times root 2 minus 1 equals negative 4 plus 5 root 2 minus 3, which simplifies to 5 root 2 minus 7. One more. Foiling out 5 root 2 minus 7 times root 2 minus 1 gives 10 minus 12 root 2 plus 7 or negative 12 root 2 plus 17, and so on. What matters here isn't the exact numbers, but just the form that they take. Each one is some integer times root 2 plus some integer, that is, k root 2 plus l for some integers k and l. We'll call this fact number 2. Note that this fact comes from the very definition of the square root of 2, that its square simplifies to 2. Fact number two could be proven by induction for those so inclined, but it's clear enough what's happening that we won't bother here. As our final step, let's suppose that root two is rational. This will be the hypothesis of the result we're about to prove. As the hypothesis, we don't care whether or not it's actually true. We simply have to make logically sound deductions from it. Symbolically, we're supposing that root two equals p over q for some integers p and q. Note that it doesn't matter whether or not this fraction is in lowest terms, but let's have q be positive for convenience. Fact number 2 tells us that every power of root 2 minus 1 is of the form k root 2 plus l. Plugging in p over q for root 2 gives k times p over q plus l, which equals kp plus ql over q. All that matters about the numerator is that it's an integer. The numerator will change depending on the power we took. The key is that no matter what the power is, the denominator is always q. Let's look at the real line and see where these fractions with denominators of q live. 0 over q, 1 over q, 2 over q, 3 over q, etc., and their negatives on the other side of 0. These values are equally spaced at a distance of 1 over q units apart, and each of our powers must be one of these numbers. So we have a sequence of powers each one living in this set of equally spaced values on the real line, and those powers have to eventually get as close to zero as we like. In particular, there's some power that's strictly less than this distance 1 over q from zero. 
And since there's only one valid point within that interval, that power must equal zero. In other words, root 2 minus 1 to the nth must equal zero for some n. Full stop, this is an actual equality of numbers, not a statement about limits. But if this power root 2 minus 1 to the nth is equal to zero for some n, then root 2 minus 1 equals zero. In other words, root 2 equals 1. In particular, we conclude that root 2 is an integer. Our argument has proven the implication that if root 2 were rational, then it would have to be an integer. But we can very easily check that root 2 is not an integer, because the closest squares of integers can get to the number 2 are 1 square, which is 1, which is less than 2, and 2 squared, which is 4, which is greater than 2, neither of which give 2. Thus, because root 2 is not an integer, root 2 cannot be rational. If it were, we've proven it would need to be an integer, which it isn't. What we're actually using is the contrapositive of our result. If root 2 is not an integer, then it's irrational. This is a more useful way to state our result. While all this work is still up, fact number one that these powers of root 2 minus 1 are going to 0, which is true, combined with fact 2 putting these powers into nice forms, immediately give us nice rational approximations of root 2. Since root 2 minus 1 is approximately 0, we can solve for root 2 to get root 2 approximately equal to 1. Not that interesting, but these rational approximations get better and better. The second power gets us root 2 is about equal to 3 halves. Then the third power tells us that root 2 is about equal to 7 fifths. The fourth power gets us root 2 about equal to 17 twelfths, and so on. This last estimate of 99 over 70 is good to within less than 1 ten thousandth, and they keep getting better. These approximations get closer to root 2 exponentially because we're taking powers of root 2 minus 1. Again, the curious thing about our proof, vis-a-vis -vis the usual proof, is that we never mention prime numbers, factorizations, or fractions being in lowest terms. This might seem like a trivial win, indeed maybe a bit more work than the usual proof of the irrationality of root 2, but it has more substance to it, rather than just being a trick with prime factors. This substance really means something because our argument didn't depend in any way on the fact that we were talking about the square root of 2. If we're careful, we can use the same logical argument to generalize this result to the square root of any positive integer. We could start with any positive integer capital N and take A as the closest integer to root N. Fact number 1 would still hold. The powers of the difference still go to 0 because root N and A differ by strictly less than 1. Fact 2 would also still hold. All of these powers would take the form k root n plus l for some integers k and l. If we suppose that root n is rational, which it might or might not be, the same argument above lets us deduce that root n equals a, in other words, that root n is an integer. What we can prove is that if root n is rational, then root n is an integer. As with our first result, this is more useful in its contrapositive form. If root n is not an integer, then root n is irrational. In other words, the only rational square roots of integers are the integral ones. This allows us to very quickly prove irrationality of lots and lots of square roots, because there simply aren't many integers to check. Integers aren't so densely packed as rational numbers. For example, if the square root of 3 is irrational, we know that root 3 must lie strictly between 1 and 2, because 1 squared is 1, which is less than 3, and 2 squared is 4, which is greater than 3. But there's no whole number between 1 and 2, so root 3 must be irrational. Even a composite number like 6 requires no extra work. Root 6 lies strictly between 2 and 3, because 2 squared is 4, which is less than 6, and 3 squared is 9, which is greater than 6. And thus it's irrational for the same reason, regardless of the fact it has two prime factors. The number of prime factors, and even square factors, doesn't change the argument. Root 120 lies strictly between 10 and 11, because 10 squared is 100, which is less than 120, and 11 squared is 121, which is greater than 120. And thus, root 120 must be irrational. All that's left are the obvious square roots. If root 9 were rational, then it would have to be an integer, which it is. Root 9 equals 3, because 3 squared equals 9. All that we have to do is check the nearest whole number.
As mathematicians, we want to generalize results as much as we can. The same techniques allow this result to be generalized further to show that any mth root of a whole number that's not an integer must be irrational. And it's not difficult, it just uses a bit more algebra and a fixed power of q in the denominator. For example, take x equals the cube root of 15, and note that by definition, x cubed equals 15. If a is the closest integer to x, which happens to be 2, fact number 1 would still hold. For fact number 2, we can show that each power x minus a to the n equals jx squared plus kx plus l for some integers j, k, and l. If x equals p over q, this gives x minus a to the n equals j times p squared over q squared plus k times p over q plus l, or jp squared plus kpq plus lq squared over q squared, which is just some integer over q squared, again, a fraction with a fixed denominator. The proof goes exactly as before. And we can show that the cube root of 15 is irrational because it's not an integer. 2 cubed is 8, which is less than 15, and 3 cubed is 27, which is greater than 15. Just check the nearest integers. Other integer roots work similarly. The word root, as in square root, cube root, and mth root, is actually a clue that this result generalizes even further. What allowed us to use this argument is that each of our numbers was a root of what's called a monic integer polynomial. That is, a polynomial with integer coefficients, for which the leading coefficient, the one the largest power, is 1. Root 2 is a solution of x squared minus 2 equals 0. Root 120 is a solution of x squared minus 120 equals 0. Cube root of 15 is a solution of x cubed minus 15 equals 0, etc. Such an equation can be solved for the highest nth power of x which shows, after a bit of algebra and an inductive argument, that all powers can be expressed as some sum of integer multiples of powers less than m of x, which is what gave us the fixed denominator in fact 2. This even works to show that the golden ratio of phi, which is the root of x squared minus x minus 1, is also irrational. Those who have seen enough algebra might recognize this general result about roots of monic integer polynomials. But the interesting bit is that this proof doesn't use any number theory at all. Hope you've enjoyed this curious and surprisingly general calculus-based technique for proving irrationality. If you like this, please like, share, and subscribe.